Hello, everybody, and welcome to Two Goals. I am Katya. And I'm Maria Laura. And today we're joined by Ellen Ward. Helen is a football player and a first-class graduate in professional sports writing and broadcasting. She currently plays for Watford FC and is an international player for the Wales national team. With clubs as Arsenal, Chelsea and Reading in a sportive career and awarded as the Wales women's all-time leading goal scorer, Helen is here to discuss about her life around football, maybe a future involved in journalism and their perspective on how to achieve success in life. Helen, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Helen, it is a great pleasure for for us to have you here. And just to jump into discussing about your football career, as an amateur player, when you start playing at What For Ladies, did you see a possible career, uh, like for future women dedicating professionally to football? No, not really. Um, I started playing when I was around eight or nine in terms of uh, playing for a team Um, and it was very much just playing for fun. There was never any thought process behind it ever being a a job or a career and that was the case right up until you know not not too long ago so I've gone through most of my career um, without it being a career path as such. It's been a choice of mine to make it my career, if that makes sense. So any other jobs I've had, I've made sure that they fitted around my football commitments. Um, And then obviously until recently, I always had other jobs alongside football. So for me, it was, you know, as as one of the older generation of players, I should say, um, the fact that there are, there is a fully professional league in in the UK and obviously across Europe and, and the world is unbelievable to to see and it and it's amazing how far it's come in what is relatively quite a short space of time. Throughout your career you've played for Arsenal, Chelsea and Reading, had big names in English football. So how can you describe those years there? You feel the pressure to wear those shirts? Yeah, I think the the, the first move was obviously from from Watford to Arsenal um, when I was I think I just turned 22 and you know, I was going from a club that I'd known all my life and, and was very happy at and, you know, felt very supported and was enjoying football, going to the best club in England and one of the best clubs in Europe. And that was that was quite a big jump to suddenly go from being the, the big fish in the small pond, if you want, into jumping into a team full of internationals, full of players that had won numerous trophies um, in the in the domestic league as well as the European title. It was it was a big step. Um, I probably say that the pressure did get to me because I don't think I ever showed my true uh, potential at, at Arsenal. But it's not to say that I ever regret going there. It, I I learned a lot. I was able to play in Europe. I played with some of the best players in the world at the time, and and I, I wouldn't change that despite the fact that I didn't really give myself the best platform. The only thing I would change is is how I I approached it myself. But in terms of the club and everything, it was it was the best place for me to be at the time, and and I thoroughly enjoyed the most part of it. So, yeah, it was it was quite a, a big thing for me at that time, um, and maybe I could have handled it better. But at the same time, I'm very proud to have, have won the trophies I did with Arsenal. I scored quite a few goals through my my year and a half there, and you know, although it didn't go exactly as I'd hoped, it was still a very big part of my career that, that I'm very proud of. When you played for uh, under-23 England national team, moving on to the international part of your career, but at senior level, you chose Wales. Can you tell us the story or the reason behind that? Uh, yeah, so um, I was doing really well for Watford, uh, scoring quite a lot of goals. We'd won promotion into the National Premier League, which is what the WSL is now. It was the top league at the time. Um you know, I'd scored a couple of goals against some of the best teams in the country. Um, and my manager, Sean Williams, who is in charge at Watford, she sort of put my name forward and said, hey, you need to have a look at her. Um, and then I got an opportunity sort of through default with England. And I just never really felt comfortable in that setting for whatever reason. I, you know, I don't think anyone is particularly to blame in person, but I just didn't ever feel like I was part of that group. Um, and it got to the point where I didn't really like the thought of, of being selected, which is obviously 
not what you want as a, as a footballer. And then it was just a throwaway comment by somebody at Watford who said, oh, you know, I don't suppose you've got Welsh grandparents, have you? Because he was involved with, with the Wales team at the time. He was the assistant manager. Um, and he, he was sort of joking about it. But obviously it turned out, I said, well, actually, yeah, my mum's parents were both born in Wales and very proud Welsh people. Um, so, yeah, why do you ask? Um, he said, well, do you fancy it like do you want to come along and it, it kind of threw me a little bit at first and it didn't take me long I had a teammate Sally Wade who was at Watford and she was playing for Wales and she said look give it a go I, I'm there I love it it's the best thing I ever did so that was it I went along to um, a senior camp and from the minute I stepped foot you know through the door it was like, it sounds so cheesy but it was like finding a new family and all the girls were brilliant the coaches were great and I just felt part of it instantly and I felt wanted and you know, as any footballer will tell you, you know, you like to think that you're quite hard and that you're able to take the criticism, but someone put their arm around the shoulder and say, look, we want you and we need you. That, that's music to your ears. That's what you want to hear. And thankfully, I got off to a good start and I scored on my debut and, and it kind of went from from there, really. And it, again, it's a decision I'll, I'll never, ever regret. I'm, I'm immensely proud to play for Wales and, and some people might find that strange having been brought up and lived my whole life in England. Um, but I very much consider myself to be Welsh now. And, and yeah, it's, you know, 90 caps down the line, it's something that I'm incredibly proud of. And every time I stand up and, and sing that national anthem, it, you know, it's the same feeling as it was all those years ago. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mad story, but it's, it's one that I'm, I'm quite happy to tell. Well, we, we did our research, and with this family that you're mentioning, this amazing story of your attachment to, to the Welsh team, um, we, we find out about that time when you scored six goals against Azerbaijan um, in the World Cup 2011 World Cup qualifiers. Tell us about this. How was it? What, what is the feeling of scoring six goals in a game? Yeah, that was crazy. Um, we actually, we were between managers. So the manager that had brought me into the Welsh team, he, he'd announced that he was leaving because it was becoming a full-time role, which was, was great for us, but he had other commitment as a goalkeeper coach I think with Swansea City at the time and it was something that he wasn't able to give up so he had to he had to let the the Welsh team go and we were we were playing that game at home and and our new manager Yamo Matikainen was actually in the stands watching so it's probably very timely that I was able to score six goals because it meant that he you know he'd sort of noticed me and had a good chance of staying in the team um, but yeah, we'd actually lost the away game in the group to Azerbaijan, which was probably one of the lower points of my my international career. We'd lost two one away, and it was it was not a very good trip for us as a, as a team. Uh, so to come back and win the home game fifteen nil um, to score six goals, I think I was the first ever Welsh player to uh, Welsh female player to score a hat trick, and I managed to get two in one game. So. Everything just went right. Everything I touched, I even miss it across. I think there's a picture of me apologising. So I miss it across and it actually went in from the sixth goal. Uh, so literally I couldn't help but score that day. And it was obviously, again, a day that I'm very proud of and, and something that will live long in the memory. And, you know, anyone that scores any goal for their country is obviously very proud. But to score six was, was quite surreal. Yeah, and uh, Wales can make it to the, the European tournament. Euro 2021 is coming up and uh, playing for Wales in England for you, it, it will be special. Uh, is, is it one of your goals to be a part of the squad ne next year, if Wales make it? Of course, yeah. You know, this European Championship, um, the qualifying campaign, has meant a lot to a lot of the players in the Welsh team. We, we came so close for the World Cup, losing that last game against England, the first defeat of, of the whole campaign for us and it was really difficult to take and there were a lot of conversations had between us there's a lot of players that are the wrong side of 30 that we were really considering whether we could go through another campaign again and we decided as a group that we'd give it one last go and that's still very much the case for for a few of us that this is this is our chance this is our biggest opportunity um obviously northern ireland are running us very close they've, they've taken two draws off us so we can't we can't ignore that um, but we've still got half a campaign to go. We've got four very important games coming up, hopefully, in the second part of this year. And, yeah, if we, if we do make it to the playoff and, and then into the, the finals itself, then I'd love to be a part of that. That's, that's been my, get, my, my aim and my goal for a massive part of my career is to represent Wales on, 
on the biggest you know biggest biggest stage and, and the big tournament so if we get there and uh, Jane Ludlow wants to pick me then I'm very much available for selection and it would you know really be the icing on the cake of of my career for uh, you know from a personal point of view international football is a big part uh, for you and your in your life and if we quote the captain of the Welsh uh, national men's team and we adapt what he said to you can we say family football Wales in that order <laughs> Uh, it's a yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, no, Wales, Wales and international football obviously means a huge amount to me, and Wales as a country is, is amazing. Obviously, my family has to come first, but yeah, Wales and football come a very close second, definitely. Just moving moving to more serious <laughs> parts, uh, we're really really curious about. I mean, with your broad experience in football, I mean, you already won the FA Cup, you already won the FA Women's Super League Cup. And you have played with many top-level club football, but from what we know, you never had a full-time professional contract. Even when you were already, after you gave birth to your first child, there were some players who, who got an offer for a full-time contract and you were offered a part-time contract. What happened then? Can you share with us your personal experience with professionalism? Yeah, so obviously when... When I was at Reading, we, we won promotion in 2015 to the top league. And, and that required the club to have a certain amount of professional players on their books. And, you know, for me, that, that season we got promoted was, was big for me because, it, like you said, it was the first season after I'd had Emily, my daughter. I'd managed to get myself back into fitness and, you know, for for a big part of that season I was starting games and scoring quite a lot of goals and, and I felt that I'd had quite a big impact on the team. I'd made a lot of I'd made a lot of goals, scored a lot of goals and and I felt that I played a big part in that promotion, especially in the last five or six games of that season. Um so to then sort of not be invited to become a professional was, was quite hard to take. Um I know that, that clubs and managers have their reasons and perhaps the fact that I I had a child and would, would require childcare and things like that. Maybe that was part of it. Um, personally, I, I felt like it was a bit of a weak excuse. It was a bit easy, sort of, well, you know, Helen can't commit because she's got a child. Um, she won't mind if we don't offer a contract. And, and that kind of hurt a little bit because it would have been nice if it was able to be my my sort of um, choice as to whether I, I was able to do it there's potential that I, I wouldn't have been able to do it but and that's fine but it, it would have been nice for me to have tried to to find out myself um but there could have been other reasons there's, there's you know football reasons obviously come into it and, and maybe they felt that other players had more to offer as professionals than, than I did and, and that's fine I carried on playing for Reading on a you know on a part-time contract and I actually took part in probably 80% of the sessions anyway so it, I wasn't particularly part-time I just missed a couple of gym sessions a week um, throughout the season but it you know it, it is what it is I, I played that season in the WSL for Reading and and then obviously moved on um, after that so it was it was tough um, but as I said I don't hold any grudges the, the club and the, the staff did what they did for their own reasons and that's fine and obviously Reading are, are doing ever so well with, since then and, and they've, they've made massive strides FA Cup semi-finals and, and pushing into the, the top four top five of the league most seasons now so you know you can't you can't say they've made too many bad decisions so it's just one of those things and maybe looking back on my career I might regret that I've, I've not had a professional contract but at the same time um, I'm proud of, of how my career has gone and the path it's taken and you know been able to achieve the things I have without ever being considered as a, a professional player in the, the truest sense of the word even though I'd like to think my actions on and off the pitch I'm quite close to it anyway. Yeah and regarding professionalism you've seen it all you started as an amateur and now you can see England having the only uh, football full professional league so how can you describe the changes and development of the game from when you started and nowadays what you see, if, for example, in the first league in England, is there more room to progress? Yeah, certainly. I think um, it's great that there is, like you said, that, that fully professional league. And 
I think that the clubs in it have really invested in in that side of it, but I think there's still a way to go. I think contracts could be better for the players, not in terms of finances, but in terms of the support and the the sort of security of them. Because I think there's quite a few ways that organisations can can make them suit themselves, and rather than being player uh, central. So I think there's there's things that can be learned on that side of it but generally speaking yeah to have the the first professional fully professional league um is is fantastic and like i said earlier from from when i was playing and not really having any female role models to look up to or any sort of you know female professional players it's um it's a massive step in you know what 20 years which okay to to the youngsters around here might seem a long time but but to most people, 20 years isn't a huge time for the game to go from relatively grassroots status right up to professional level. And you can see the rewards that's coming through the, the performances of the Lionesses at, at major tournaments. They're expected to win things now and they're, they're consistently getting to semi-finals and finals of competitions. And, you know, I think that's a product of, of what they're creating back home in, in, the, in the professional league. Helen, you mentioned something which is really, really interesting in the idea that it's not only about salaries, it is about a system supporting a footballer, supporting the development of a, a footballer in many other areas. So I, I just wanted to ask you, how do you manage to play football and raise two kids? How difficult it is for you and your family when you live, for example, for international team duties or for club duties? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, I'm very fortunate I've got family my husband my parents his parents and and you know what for now in particular uh, a, a group of people that are very supportive in the fact that I've got two young children and their needs have and always will have to come first that's just you know how it is anyone with a family would be the same so you can probably hear them in the background actually <laughs> and so it's quite often difficult to juggle and you have to make difficult decisions sometimes whether that means having to miss the odd training session or or what have you that that's just part and parcel of it thankfully I don't have to miss many things if at all um, because like I said I've got my family around me who who do a lot for me in terms of childcare and allowing me the time to train and play when I need to and and being fully supportive of that I never feel like there's any resentment towards my football career they know how big a part of my life my football is and and without it I'd be a very different person so I have to I have to thank them really um but it also I think it goes to prove that you you can achieve what you want to achieve if if you make time not excuses and you know it's one of my favorite quotes is if you want to do something enough you'll find the time to do it and and that's kind of how I've lived my life if if I find myself struggling to find the time then I probably look at what I'm trying to do and think well do you really want to do it because if you can't find the time then then obviously it's not something that's that's at the forefront of your mind so that's kind of how I look at things. As I said, family always comes first, but thankfully that family allows me to carry on with football and, and not have to make too many sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about kids, uh, there's always a huge topic regarding to women's playing football, which urges to be discussed. Uh, maternity leave for the players. Uh, it is what it is. And we know uh, that you, six weeks after giving birth to your son, you went to Russia to play for the national team. Can, can, you, can you tell us how is the situation uh, uh, in England or Wales about the maternity leave? And after having two babies, uh, do you think what they provide for the new mothers, it's enough to cover it? Uh, in a word, no, I don't think it's enough. Um, as, as you said, I've never been on a professional contract, so I'm not sure what they look like exactly at the moment. I'm led to believe they're not brilliant in terms of maternity provision in this country, at least. I think it's probably quite different in somewhere like the, uh, the United States because they've got quite a few of their players that are mothers. And I believe that they do have provisions um, either in terms of finances or, you know, physical childcare. Um, but over here, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I rely heavily on my family I don't get any support from from anyone from football in terms of being able to deal with childcare or pay for childcare um, and I've just kind of gone with that it is what it is like you said um, because it's something I want to do um, I want to play football so my family appreciate that and they allow me to do it um, 
the six weeks six weeks post birth um, trip to Russia was an interesting one. I was never in, ten, in contention to play. I was very grateful for Jane to take me over on the trip because she knew how much I wanted to be back amongst the girls as quick as possible just to get back into the routine. But obviously I was never going to be fit enough to compete at that sort of level so soon after. But it was a really productive trip for me because it, it sort of showed me where I was at physically and it allowed me to then go away and, and work on the things that I needed to so that come the next camp I was ready and available for selection, which thankfully I was. Um, but yeah, it's, I've got I've got a lot of support from people in those organisations and managers, coaches, a lot of understanding and that sense. But I think from from the organisations themselves, I think there's a long way to go from the likes of the FA, possibly the FAW as well, that if there are more women in the game that are having children, you know, Siobhan Chamberlain's got a little girl and I believe she had to take up some some different kind of work to subsidise the fact that she wasn't playing. And I think these things need to be looked at because you should never be punished for wanting to have a family. It's not something the men have to do. They don't have to factor in having children because they don't physically change in that time. It's it's just the way of the world that women do. And, and I don't think we should be punished for that. Absolutely. And Ellen, you have a boy and a girl. And you're an advocate at, of the game. We can say that. So imagine now your girl loves football and her dream is to be a footballer. After all you lived, uh, would you encourage her? And which kind of advice would you give to her because you faced all the struggles until now? Yeah, of course I'd encourage her. I, I encourage her to do what, what she'd like to do. And if that's football, then obviously I'd be delighted. If it's not, then... You know, as long as she's happy, I'd, I'd never try and push her into football if that's not something she wants to play. Um, but I'd like her to be involved in sport in some way, whether it's, you know, whatever level it's at, because I think it, it, it offers so many rewards on so many levels. I think it teaches you a lot, not just about physical fitness and physical talent, but it, it teaches you about teamwork and dedication, determination, working hard for something. And, and I think that's, you know, traits that I'd like to think I could pride myself on. So for her and for my son, for Charlie, I think I'd encourage them both to get into sport if, if that's what they like. And if they don't, then again, I'm not going to push them too far. I'll, I'd, I'd like them to be dedicated in whatever it is they choose to do. But hopefully the, the likes of myself and, and the players that are playing now, we've paved the way for a generation of, of young girls to follow that dream if it is what, what they want to do. And they've got female role, role models now that they can look up to. And female role models that boys can look up to as well, you know. Yeah. There's nothing to say that you can't have a role model that's not the same sex. I had role models that were the, that are guys, you know, from growing up, and it could be the same the other way. So to see anybody pursuing a, a career and a dream and, and being successful, I think, um, is brilliant for anyone to see. Ellen, um, from the discussion that we had before about you maybe participating in Euro 2021, We're sure that there isn't any short-term plans of you retiring, but actually we're curious about, do you think players, they, they do have the necessary tools to think about retirement and what they can offer after a footballing career right now? I think a lot of players probably of my age, sort of around, you know, 32, 33, possibly anything from 30 upwards, I think we probably have, had to think about that for a bit longer because the professional game hasn't been uh, as prevalent in our careers. Um, whereas the players that are younger than that, that have grown up around being paid to play football, perhaps have put other career paths or other education sort of on the back burner, which, which does worry me. And it's something that I think, you know, going back to what can be done for players in a professional game, I think that side of things should be looked after. I hear too many stories that, that young players have been a, encouraged or advised not to carry on with university studies or something like that because they should be putting their football career first and they're not able to fit studying around football and I think that's a really dangerous game to play because that you know an injury or a loss of form and, and suddenly you don't have a contract what what do you do how do you get yourself into a, into an employable position um you know elsewhere in the world not just football so it, it does worry me that there's not enough done um, for people, the younger generation um, that are coming into 
football now or have done in the last sort of five or ten years um i'd like to think that there's things in place that they could well be at different clubs there could be part uh, things put in place at clubs that i'm obviously not privy to but um i'd like to see more encouragement of, of dual careers and and trying to further yourself off the pitch as well as on it i think i think in this in this part around retirement this is like a huge opportunity for women's football and i will try and explain myself because i think since women have struggled a lot between becoming a professional footballer and working in some other jobs to try and pursue their dreams in football they already have this in mind and we we have had many guests here already and we discussed that women are already planning because of these issues that they that they face when they enter the footballing world. Do you think maybe, because we keep saying, what can women's football learn from the business on the men's side? And what can we learn from them to improve? Maybe they can learn from this part that maybe footballers, like female footballers, they are better at planning some other retirement um, exits from football. And maybe men, they are struggling in that part. What do you think from that? Yeah, I think that's probably a fair comment. I think, like you said, we, we, we've grown up where we've had to think of careers. And even those players are talking about coming into football now on full-time contracts, those contracts are never going to be enough to live on once you do stop playing. Even if you have a 10, 15-year career, the, the chances of you retiring on that money are very, very slim at the moment. Though Those salaries are nowhere near high enough to, to sort of pay for you for the rest of your life. Whereas you play one one season in the men's Premier League and, and you're done, you're set. If you use your money wisely, you never have to work again. So, yeah, I think that women's football and women's footballers do have that advantage in that, in that they've had to sort of better themselves away from the pitch and had to take up things that, that don't necessarily revolve around playing football and, and, and learn new things, learn new skills that, that can then aid them in their, their future careers. Whereas the, the young boys coming out of academies and into first teams, they've probably not thought about carrying on any sort of studying for the main part. And um, as I said, it's the same for them. If they had one injury or, you know, they don't get offered a contract, then they need to have somewhere to go. And, and women's football is perhaps are a little bit better prepared for that just because they know that once it ends, whenever that is, they are going to need another career. Yeah, exactly. And let me add your note. I, I really think they, uh, they um, plan he ahead the future. And uh, I think I can tell when I, when I met Helen, we met at a women in football workshop and I was the only one there that was not a player. So I was shocked. And maybe Helen remembers that I was shocked with everything around me because we had players with 20, 21, 22 years old and they, they were already thinking about retirement and what to do next. So with 20, 20 years old, you, you don't see a player on, and let's talk about England in the first, second, third or, or fourth year thinking about that uh, unless they have a, an injury or something. But usually they, they think about progressing in the game and the, the women's uh, uh, are not, thinking about that or most of them and we are talking about England that has the only full time professional league that's why I was shocked <laughs> that day because as around me I, I was thinking about my future but all of a sudden saying these girls they have to think about training they have to think about playing and also that tomorrow they they maybe they can have to have an, another profession so this is really worried and Helen about the plans to the future, uh, going to your life, why did you choose to study a degree in sports writing and broadcasting? What kind of role do you think the written press and broadcasting have in developing women's football right now? I think it has a huge role. Uh, the reason I chose it was that I'd just come to a point in my life where I'd had Emily and I'd given up the job that I had, which was as a teaching assistant in a school for children with special needs so it was nothing to do with football but it was a job that I couldn't go back to after having a child because the childcare would have cost too much um, and the salary wouldn't have paid for it so it was a case of being better off being at home with my daughter and you know being at home as a mum so I thought well what can I do with my time 
rather than just sit around and, and not try and you know think of a career when when the children are older and and I can go back to to working um you know alongside or after football um what what can I do that I enjoy and I'd always enjoyed uh the the media side of football and doing interviews seeing how they will how they how they worked and what was what went on sort of behind the scenes of them um and I'd always enjoyed writing at school I always quite enjoyed English as a subject and so I just thought well the PFA I was I'm a member of the PFA and they had some courses going at a, at a reduced rate as a as a PFA member and it was a mostly distance learning course um so I thought why well, why not go for it and and I'm so glad I did because it was two years of of studying that was really worth it and I learned an awful lot and you know from there it's opened up opportunities and doors that I probably wouldn't have had had I not done that course and some of the stuff I already knew but it was nice to know that what I, what I thought I knew was right um, and also I learned a lot of new stuff so for me it was a no-brainer to to do a course like that and and now it's sort of a, an option for me going forward to work in that area um, and in terms of what broadcasters and and the written press can do for the women's game I think it's huge because the more you see it and the more you hear it the more you're going to take notice of it and you know you get people that that think oh it's been shoved down our throats or we don't want to hear about women's sport and women's football but gradually those voices will get quieter and the people that do want to see it they'll they'll enjoy it and it'll be out there and it'll become much more of a a marketable product product so things like sponsors and um you know big investors if it's if it's being seen and heard then then people want to get involved and that's that's where the money comes in and then that's how the product grows so I think the media and the press have a huge part to play in the growth of women's football over the next sort of five or ten years for sure. Do you think is there an advantage for you because you were a footballer for you to write about football or is this maybe seen as a disadvantage? What do you think about that? Um, I don't know. I haven't really ever thought about whether it's an advantage or not. I, I think it depends what kind of written press you're doing I suppose. If you're doing comment pieces where you're giving an opinion then I'd like to think my background as a footballer would be quite helpful because I could relate to the players how they're potentially feeling or what they're going through um if it's more of a if you if you're more of a, a journalist that that's doing sort of your, your facts and your, your pieces that are more um I don't know how to describe it but where, where you're not putting so much emotion into it then then it might be a bit more difficult because your your overriding feeling would be to put that emotion into it because you have have those experiences so I think it could work both ways it depends on just depends on what you're what you're writing on and, and how you're writing it really if that makes sense. Helen as a player you've been in the game for a long time uh, with a, a lot of difficult times with injuries but you make it so to finalize this episode would you leave here a message for the young girls who want to pursue a career in football? Yeah I think if you if you want to achieve something you're going to have to work hard for it um you're going to come across things that you feel like are boundaries or or things that are going to get in your way but you have to work out how you're going to get around them if, if someone's trying to stop you playing try and think about why they're trying to stop you and how you can overcome that whether it's an injury you know in my case my, my two longest layoffs have been having children but because I wanted to come back I made sure I made the right plan and did the right thing to enable me to come back um, and it's basically because I enjoy it so if you love something I keep coming back to it if you love something you'll make the time to do it and that that's what it comes down to it's the passion and the love you have for playing football if that ever goes away then perhaps it's not the right career for you but if you if it doesn't if you've still got that fire in you then keep coming keep going keep working if somebody says you know I'm not going to pick you because of this reason take that reason and turn it into a positive thing if it's because my left foot's not good enough then work on that left foot if it's because you're not good enough at tackling then work on tackling but also carry on working on what you know you are good at don't always look at the negatives take what you know you're good at make those better make them into superpowers super strengths and then improve on the the other areas of the game but the biggest thing is enjoy it and work hard there's, there's no better advice than that for me hello we are so grateful to have you here as a guest. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And Thank you very much for having me. Apologies if the children made a lot of noise in the background. <laughs> no, no, no. This is all 
about this to try and, and share the stories like as real as they are. And for all of you out there, thank you so much for hearing us. And remember, we're available on Twitter and Instagram with the name Two Goals Podcast. If you know someone that should be our guest or if you have any story to share with us in our platform, do contact us since we're here for that. Stay tuned and see you next week.